Hello and welcome to episode 2 of the Scratchcast, the alternative pop culture podcast. I'm Sneds, your host, and I'm back with the one and only Grant Patterson to bring you a bumper episode covering a whopping five albums released throughout 2019 so far. This time we've picked a theme where every album and artist is related to the colour black, and as a result we've got a pretty diverse collection of records from Pixies, Black Futures, Black Mountain, Weezer and Black Dresses. So it's time to sit back once again and enjoy the dulcet tones of two nobodies who love talking about music. Enjoy. You'll share man's greatest thrill. I've tried and tried and failed and failed. They tried and died. You're dealing with the corrupt the corrupt. Okay, so we start with a new Pixies album, Beneath the Eerie. We're going to go with that pronunciation. <laughs> um, <laughs> apparently there's a wee bit of uh, controversy over how best to spell it. I had no idea what an eerie was. If I'm perfectly honest, I thought it had something to do with a church. Um, and interestingly, in an interview that I came across on YouTube um, that the Pixies did for Radio.com Music, which was published a day before the album's release, so on the 12th of September, the, the album itself was released on the 13th. Dave Lovering, the the drummer, relates that behind the church there was a bald eagle's nest and being an avid bird watcher he was pretty stoked by this and it, th- it appears as if this is where the, the album titles came up from. He was kind of quick to identify that he never came up with the title but it would appear as if that's where it's come from and Eerie is actually an eagle's nest. Oh. So that that's where it comes from. We've enlightened us all. <laughs> there I we go. I've, no I've put it to think. bed. Um, and this is the, the kind of seventh the Pixie's seventh studio album, eighth if you include the 2018 album, Live from the, the Fallout Shelter, which I have to admit kind of passed me by, to be honest. I never knew it existed until I kind of looked back in their, their past discography. Um, but it's just a collection of, of live music, live tracks. I was actually surprised that it was only their seventh studio release. I kind of expected... So Pixies have been going, what, since the, the 80s? Late 80s. Late 80s. I Late kind of 80s. just expected them to have more than seven albums but I mean seven's it's still a lot of albums it's, it's quite substantial so Indie Cindy was released I want to say hmm, off the top of my head what 2000, 2011 or 2011 12? something like that that was their first studio album in something like 23 years and it was the first album that released without the original bassist Kim Deal yeah um, so this is their their third album I suppose since since Kim since Deal's departure since reunited yeah yeah okay so without trying to sound like too much of a knob I feel like the Pixies are like the quintessential alt rock band yeah yeah I would, I would give you that I think if you if you want to explain to somebody what alt rock is probably tell them to listen to the Pixies yeah it's the most as, as alternative as rock gets probably they're certainly trailblazers to be honest I was actually looking back and some of the kind of DVDs that I've I've got I've got a DVD. It's kind of I think it's a collection of their kind of live shows, but it's also got a documentary on it called Gouge Away, where David Bowie's getting interviewed, and he he's quite a big fan, and he said that there's a kind of saying with regards to the Velvet Underground. He believes it to be kind of just as true of the Pixies that maybe not a lot of people bought say the Velvet Underground's albums or the Pixies album, but everybody who did went out and started a band because they wanted to be like the Pixies and famously Kurt Cobain is kind of quoted in saying that when he wrote Smells Like Teen Spirit he was basically trying to write a Pixies Pixies song so they've been majorly influential over the last however many years, yeah, 20 I, years. I think Neil Young gets a lot of credit for being the godfather of grunge or whatever mm. but I think the Pixies have got a lot to answer for as well Absolutely. So Indie Cindy is the only Pixies album I've ever bought Really? Um, apart from their greatest hits, oh, Death right. of the Pixies. Yeah. And that, Pixies for me are a band that I haven't listened to too much on record. It's all been basically through that Death of the Pixies album mm-hmm. and then just like hitting up individual tracks, really less than, not really listening to, to the albums and, as a whole, um, except for Indie Cindy, which I bought pretty much when it came out on, on vinyl. And mm. it's it's pretty good. It's, it's not amazing, but it's not bad. There's some pretty pretty good tracks on it. And then last time you talked about Head Carrier, which I don't think either of us knew existed, and which I still haven't listened to. 
it's a pretty throwaway album, to be honest, and I say that as being a pretty die-hard Pixies <laughs> band, to be honest. There's a few standout tracks there. Bale's Back, or Bale's Back, I don't know how you pronounce it. That's that's the, the kind of one shouty song um, on the album. I think every Pixies, um, every Pixies album that's been released since the departure of Kim Deal has kind of featured a, a shouty song. Blue-Eyed Hex being Indie Cindy's kind of shouty song. I think on Beneath the Eerie, it's the Saint Nazir? Nazir? I don't know how you pronounce it. Yeah, I've written down this is fucking demented rock and roll, man. <laughs> <laughs> so I think it's a pretty a pretty hefty driving track. And yeah, I think you're right about the shouty, sort of gritty, seething, foaming at the mouth kind of vocals. Which used to be part of the course for the Pixies. Yeah. You know, if you listen to Come On Pilgrim, Surfer Rose and, and Do Little... The first two albums, um, so far was a common pilgrims. Technically, two EPs in one. Yeah. It was it was brought together into into the one album and do little. I mean, Frank Black shouted quite a lot, <laughs> to be honest. But I just don't think he's capable of that kind of vocal range anymore. But it's still it's still good to hear him kind of crack out a shouty song every now and again. Blood Hex off the Indie Cindy album was pretty pretty cracking. So what what are the standout tracks on? Um Beneath the Eerie for you? Um, there's a few. I mean, it's funny, I don't know what you kind of made of Beneath the Eerie, but I felt as if certainly the first maybe four or five songs felt almost like something from Brothers Grimm. There's a definite uh, gothic kind of element cat, to it. Catfish Kate is like a... Kind of folk ballad is, almost. Yeah, and it's, it is like a grim fairy tale, I suppose, because it's, it's about a woman getting kidnapped by a catfish. Yes. And then well, she's trying to catch the catfish to, to put in her favourite dish, okay. so that so the lyric goes. And then um, the catfish grab, grabbed her by her head and brought her down to his house instead. Something along those and lines. Then I think she they? battles them and then comes out like wearing them as like a suit. <laughs> yeah, like she she comes out part human, part catfish. <laughs> With his um, with his whiskers for like her the belt of her robes or something. Something like that. It's, it's, a, weird it's, it's a bit out there to be honest, but I mean it's, you know, the Pixies have always kind of dealt with quite out there kind of subject matter, and like I said, uh, you know, the first four or five songs certainly did feel like something that kind of brothers the brothers Grimm and kind of when I was doing a wee bit of research for this album again, and that it was in, actually the interview for NME. I think they were kind of asked what kind of served as inspiration for the for the album if there was any kind of theme and kind of Black Francis as he's kind of going um, going by just now he kind of relates that he lost a tooth okay. and uh, decided to put it into his black guitar and apparently it was quite kind of visually arresting um, he then he, he then started thinking that they would write a goth album however he kind of identified that he was thinking more long lines of kind of goth music and was thinking particularly of kind of writing something along lines of kind of you know, um, just there's a mercy. However, this changed to change from gothic music to being more gothic, if that makes sense. So, in keeping right, with that kind of yeah, subject yeah. matter. And as I kind of mentioned earlier on, when I was kind of talking about uh, Dave Lovering and you know finding the the kind of Eagle's Nest and what have you, they actually recorded this album in a church. So when I kind of mentioned there being mm-hmm. a, an Eagle's Nest behind the church, uh, the church in question is. Um, Dreamland Recording Studios, which is apparently a rem- remote converted church in upstate New York, and apparently that kind of helped to serve as kind of an inspiration for the, the kind of subject matter. Yeah, um, I've actually written for um, for track six, Silver Bullet. I've 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 written down that that feels like a Brothers Grimm fairy tale. See, so I think it like you, you obviously highlighted those first four tracks, but it does seem to be a, a running theme mm-hmm. in terms of those first four tracks. The opener. In the arms of Mrs. Mark of Cain, it's just a real rocking opener. Driving drums, clear, clean guitars, where they're quite eerie. Mm-hmm. There's some pretty cool vocal lines, and I mean, I had a look at what the Mark of Cain was because it's from the Bible. Um, yeah, aye. and it's like God protecting Cain from his would-be aggressors, and anyone that attacked him would be harmed sevenfold. Interesting to know. I I find it quite hard to interpret songs a lot of the time because lyrics are 
quite difficult to get to grips with sometimes. I think especially and with the pixies. Are <laughs> a bit abstract, I think. Aye. Sometimes interesting to look at these names. I mean, sometimes the names of songs are just because, yeah, that sounds it's cool. A, yeah, it sounds good. It's got an interesting collection of words. Yeah. yeah. Um, certainly, as I said, you know, well, as you said, sorry, they're in the arms of Mrs. Mark of Cain, you know, the title itself being a kind of biblical reference, like you said, that's always been a kind of staple of Black Francis's yeah. writings, and it's kind of came up time and time again over the course of their their stuff. I thought it actually sounded quite a lot like some of their previous tracks, and particularly the happening and all all around, sorry, all over the world, uh, which is two tracks from their nineteen ninety album, uh, Bossa Nova. However, maybe with a bit more of a kind of driving bass line and kind of a bit more purpose behind it as well. But I thought it was a pretty good opening track, to be honest. Yeah, I think the the, the following song on Graveyard Hill Fantastic. feels like a, a proper like classic Pixies song with the, with this sort of rumbling bass line and there's this signature screeching Pixies guitars and it's got like a, a pretty good sing along chorus. Yeah, there's a few cheeky hand claps thrown in for. All right, for never noticed measure. that, but yeah, cool. Um, but yeah, that that for me kind of stood out as like being. This sounds like the Pixies. Yeah, that was the first sig- uh, single from was the that album. The first one that came. Um, out? And Catfish Kate followed followed that after. But yeah, I would agree definitely in keeping with kind of the more traditional Pixies that we kind of know and love. I thought it was fantastic to be honest. I, I definitely thought it was a bit of a kind of return to form to be honest from some of the stuff that they've done previously. Interestingly, in that same interview that I kind of mentioned earlier on. The first thing that comes out Black Francis's mouth is this is the album that he's most proud of. Really? Mm-hmm. Out, of out of all the stuff yeah, that he's done, this is this is the album that he's most proud of. And uh, he was trying to get back to that kind of acoustic guitar sounds, which was quite prevalent in the first two albums. Uh, yeah. It doesn't feature in this song, but it features in kind of some there's, of the later there's songs. There's quite a bit of more acoustic strip back kind of stuff. I think this is my fate is worth talking about because it's like I don't know how to describe it. It's sort of bouncy and jaunty, but it's also quite dark at the same time. There's like heavy bass and like bassy like piano, I think, in the background. <laughs> it's almost like a song to 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 listen to when you're absolutely slaughtered and like fancy just dancing like an absolute idiot. Yeah, yeah. It kind of reminded me of you know that scene in Shrek. Where they go and visit, I think it's like the villain's bar, and Doctor Hook's playing on the the piano. Do you know what scene I'm talking about? Is that no. in the first film? It's in the first or second film, but interestingly, it's it's Tom Waits. It's a Tom oh, Waits song, yeah, okay. and I thought this felt, felt very much felt like Tom Waits song. But also, I've written like you, you're kind of talking about his kind of, this kind of jaunty melody. I've written. Oompa, <laughs> oompa type Oompa-type melody. Yeah. Um, I definitely get the Tom Waits comparison. Yeah, it's got that. It's definitely got that sort of vibe about it. I am um, one thing I've written down is that the song's called "This Is My Fate" and there's sort of lyrics about you know it, it repeats this. This is my fate, and it it almost feels like he's trapped in this this situation in I don't know in a bar like having you know continually drinking and dancing and it just it brought to mind um a new year's eve that we had um <laughs> where we ended up in a bar at the bells and yeah the, and it was just gilcomston the most, steps it's the bar is called the gilcomston and it's the most depressing new year's eve that i've ever had just in this bar full of old men terrible <laughs> music and the most interesting thing that happened was a drunk fell out of his chair Within about like seconds of us walking through yeah. the door, yeah. Um, um, and then the barmaid. So the the bells, so the bells kind of came and went, and the barmaid came from behind the bar, wished everybody happy new year, and then was basically saying like, "Off you go, that's it." Yeah, immediately just thrown <laughs> out. Like, that, that's it. Yeah. That, so I don't know why it reminded me of that. It just it just kind of did. Yeah, the kind of rem- reminded me a wee bit of the door song, um, whiskey bar. Okay, you know, you know that song. I'll not show sure me the way to the next whiskey bar. I'm not going to sing the full song, but yeah, know, it's the, that kind of same kind of melody, that same kind of feel to it. Interestingly as well, I kind of felt as if it, it reminded me a bit of a kind of modest mouse song, uh, Bukowski. Um, I've not heard that. Just just this one this one bit um, in the Bukowski song, which is quite interesting because I think modest mouse would probably cite the Pixies as, as an influence yeah. you know so 
I mentioned before Silver Bullet, which I think is probably my favourite song on the album. Just from it's like a really brooding slow burner it opens up like a clock ticking it's very really melancholy um, and then there's just great melodies through the through the verse and chorus and um, bursts of guitar riffs and screeches and it's just I don't know I just think it's a fantastic song see I think it's interesting you say that because I I seem to remember when we were talking about Indie Cindy you know when it first came out Silver Snail was one of your favourite yeah, songs yeah I haven't really delved into the kind of lyrics of both songs in any great detail, to be honest. However, I kind of get the impression this is maybe a sequel to Silver Snail. I don't know why. I don't know why. Um, I think both both songs kind of reference kind of loaded guns, and it almost kind of feels as if Silver Snail, if you remember that, that's almost kind of written from the perspective of the gunman, and this is kind of Silver Bullet is almost written from the perspective of. The, the potential victim. Interesting. Yeah, there's my take on that. I, I mean, <laughs> I'd, I'd completely forgotten the names of any of the songs on Indie Cindy, but yeah, now that you mention it, yeah. Silver Snail was one of my favourites. They sound similar, however, I think um, the kind of tempo and Sulphur Bullets is a bit faster, to be honest. Yeah. Any other songs of, of note? We talked about Saint Nazir, Nazir, Nazair. I think that's an absolute belter. Yeah. Um, it's just. A blistering rock and roll song from start to finish. Um, any other standouts? I quite, I quite enjoyed the kind of last two tracks as well. Kind of Daniel Boone. Absolutely no idea who Daniel Boone is. To be honest, <laughs> I've got a f- feeling he's some sort of seventeenth century outback pioneer or something like that. Um, I quite enjoyed it. You know, it's not unlike some of the stuff that the Pixies have done previously. It's kind of got that kind of dream, dreamy sound. I would have thought that was maybe the kind of better way of finishing the album, to be honest. However, track twelve, uh, the kind of the closing track with "Death Horizon," which I really enjoyed. I'm not too sure if it really is a Pixie song. It kind of reminded me of something that you might have heard off Frank Black's Honeycomb album, his solo, solo album, okay. um, which released in two thousand five. Um, but I enjoyed it nevertheless. I. I'm not a big fan of Daniel Boone, to be honest. It's it's okay. I get this sort of dreamy, acoustic-y. And it prob- I think you're right. It probably would have made more sense as a closing uh, track. That's what I thought. Death Horizon. I think Death Horizon is very good. Mm. But maybe not as an end track. But it's, it feels like an anthem, I think. It's sort of a song that I feel like you could have a group of people all singing it together. And, you know, like... A, Okay, the lyrics are about sort of death and death up coming upon us and that kind of thing, but it felt like something like the, just the, in a musical fashion, like something you might hear at the end of a feel good movie when all the family are together singing a little song together. Yeah. And musically only, not 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 in terms of lyrics or subject matter. And then I've written down that it's like the end of Bugsy Malone when they're all like <laughs> sit around the piano. Like have you seen Bugsy Malone? Joanna a years ago. Yeah. yeah. So at the end they're all like there's a big battle at the end and then they all kind splurge of like, guns. Yeah with the splurge yeah, guns. Yeah. And then they all like the guy starts playing the piano and then they all sort of start singing arm in arm at the end. And it, it just had that kind of vibe for me. Um but it's a song about death um, <laughs> coming your way. Yeah. But yeah, so it, um, I think it's one, it's one of the one of the best tracks on the album. I think, but maybe just out of place. Yeah, aye, I would I would go with I would agree with you there. But yeah, all in all, yeah, a really enjoyable album. It's it's kind of difficult to pin down what's so good about the Pixies. To be honest, yeah. you know, I was, I was kind of struggling yeah, because they are my favourite band. Um, have been for for quite some time now, but I don't know what it is that kind of attracts me to them to be honest I think I don't think you can pinpoint any one thing they're a surprising band they they don't really settle into any kind of formula no I think that's why I was sort of saying at the start that they're the quintessential alt rock band there's always something surprising Mm -hmm. you never quite get exactly what you would expect on any given album I would have thought yeah yeah um but yeah, overall, I really enjoyed this album, and I think it flows really well. There, you know, some there's some dips in quality, but overall, as a listening experience from start to finish, it's pretty solid. Yeah, I would agree, man. Um, there are a few tracks 
Ready for Love, for example. Yeah, I love yeah, it. Frank Black you know. was kind of, well, Black Francis was kind of, just kind of felt as if he was kind of phoning it in a wee bit. He yeah. sounded, <clears throat> sounds as if he was ready for, ready for his bed rather than ready for love, <laughs> to be honest. But there was a kind of tonal change after um, that kind of initial kind of chorus, I suppose. And I think, you know, when, when there has been kind of wee dips, there is dips here and there. I think Joey Santiago's guitar lines kind of, they never fail to deliver and it kind of just boils that's that, true even honest. even on the the, the less good songs yeah. for, for a better way of saying it there's bits in it that, that kind of elevate them uh, absolutely um, yeah. and occasionally there, like, there's a song um, this is more a vocal thing there's a song called Bird of Prey and, and it's got it's got really vivid lyrics like there's um, Frank Black talks about he says I'll set my broken bone mm. with a twist and a crack Yeah. and it's it's the, the sort of feeling uh, that that evokes is very vivid. Aye, and I suppose again that's in keeping with the kind of, as we said, that kind of gothic theme, because um, it then goes on to say, "Now your cover's blown, you buried me, but but I came back." I can't quite remember how it carries on after that. Yeah. It's something about you stole my yesterday or sort of something like that. It's about seeking revenge anyway. Um, but yeah, but yeah, overall a good album. Um, do you want to give it a rating? Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> so it's an it's an album I've I've really enjoyed. Uh, you know, I come back to I've I've came back to time time again. So I'm sold five out of ten. <laughs> no, honestly, I think I think I would. I want to say probably eight or nine out of ten to be honest. But I'm a bit biased because it's the Pixies, so I'm never gonna rate them poorly. I don't think. Yeah, I I love the Pixies. I'm not a super fan. I haven't heard all of their albums, but I do like them a hell of a lot. I think this is a solid eight, maybe yeah. pushing a nine as well, like you say. And I think it's somewhat of a return to form. I would, I would definitely agree with you there. Yeah, definitely agree with you. Black Futures. Black Futures. Never Not Nothing. Okay, so let's um, talk about Black Futures' debut album, Never Not Nothing. Mm-hmm. So I've I've heard them described as industrial noise punks. How do you feel about that description? Yeah, I would go with that. Yeah. Did you know that they're a duo? I knew that. I kind of get the impression though, from what I've seen, it's a wee bit off topic maybe, but... It feels as if they're trying to develop a bit of a brand yes. for themselves, which isn't necessarily a bad thing. You know, they've got their own motif, they've got their own logo yeah. already. Yeah, I mean, I quite like when there's a bit of mystery and, you know, a sort intrigue. of intrigue about a band, yeah. And actually, um, I thought I'd written... Yeah, so if you... I was trying to find out where the band are from, who they are, that kind of thing. And uh-huh. It's all about vague... In interviews, they, they, they don't really answer the questions, and it's like, oh yeah, we're from outer space, and like oh, weird really? weird stuff like that. And if you actually go to their website, the quote, the, uh, the, the description of the band is, A no-holds-barred oral assault of anarchic electro-psych-punk noise that ends up something like Death From Above and The Chemical Brothers' Bastard Offspring. I so think that's pretty apt, yeah, if I'm honest. Yeah, I think that's their own description of themselves. And then it goes on to say, so the album's called Never Not Nothing, so they have a series of things that say Never Not A Band, Never Not Punk, Never Not A Doomsday Cult, Never Not Heroes of the Multiverse, <laughs> Never Not Jim from Down the Chippy, Never Not Nothing. So there's definitely a sense of humour yeah. oh, um, that goes along with this image that they're trying to push forward for themselves. In my opinion, they sound a bit like The Prodigy, Kasabian, Pendulum, maybe Chemical Brothers as they mentioned not I sure have, so much about Death From Above but maybe that's just the sort of bass heavy duo kind of thing coming in but kind of all thrown into a blender and like left to mutate into just this wild untamed entity and it's fucking brilliant Aye. I mean I don't know how else you'd describe it other than what we've already said it's got you know there's these big 
fuzzed up buzzing bass lines there's sort of thundering drum beats strange electronics weird screaming vocal loops just so many different interesting things that are that are thrown in in these songs I think the the, the second song Love stands out for me to be yeah. honest this was a single that was released on the 22nd of December way back in 2017 oh, I so heard the I, I, I hadn't heard the single when it came out back then just I kind of discovered that when I was doing a wee bit of a research um, so that the first track of the album is the three ends NNN never not nothing um, and it's only a, just under a minute long and round about kind of the 46 second mark you can kind of, kind of hear that bass line kind of building up and then it bursts into the second song the second song being love and that kind of coincides with this screaming lyrics um, 10 minutes until the end of the world and you actually feel as if that's the case to be honest the sense of urgency is palpable and that kind of coincides with this kind of I've described it as an Inception-esque like wah <laughs> which almost kind of sounds like an alarm going off yeah yeah okay. um, and it just kind of slowly builds in intensity over the course of the kind of next four minutes um, I'm not 100% sure how long the, the song lasts but it just accumulates into this kind of unnerving unsettling apocalyptic anthem yeah I think that's an accurate way of describing it. I think that that as an intro, those those sort of two those tracks, two tracks are phenomenal. Like N N N is just like a sort of eighty synth sort of yeah. piece. Yeah. And then it, the way it leads right into love um, is perfect. And then that that two minutes and is it two or ten minutes? I thought it was ten minutes. I don't know. Either way, we'll say it's ten. So ten minutes until the end of the world. Make love, make love. It's yeah. just like. It's so much fun to, to sing along to, and that make love, but it's just screamed. And um, I listened to this on the way here, and I'm, I was on my own listening to that track, and just out on the open road on your own screaming along to that. It's just so much fun. And then, yeah, you mentioned the sort of Inception esque, but it's like this sort of war. That, that's, yeah, like, that's all I could say. It, like, it used to be in like every trailer, um, for it probably still is, to be fair, but. A sort of intense bass sound. Yeah, uh, it's got that. And then I thought it came across as like a bit like the Prodigy's Spitfire. There's that sort of drum Good beat, point, actually. Yeah. Um, like maybe a bit of, of a sort of heavier version of of that, but it's got that sort of really addictive drum beat. And then you've got rapping on it from P.O.S. P-O-S. Presume that means piece of shit. I don't know. Never heard of him before, <laughs> but I did a wee bit of research before you 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 came in. I I. I just assumed quite wrongly that this was I don't want to say just a rapper but it was you know a hip hop artist but by the sense of things this guy does a bit of everything um, his name's Stefan Alexander apparently he's a founding member of an indie hip hop collective known as Doom Tree and he fronts a number of punk bands as well wow. so I had absolutely no idea a wee bit of everything he's got a few albums under the, the pseudonym of P.O.S uh-huh. um, and I've, I've heard basically one track it's called Get Down and really? it's like a really powerful electronic song with sort of lyrics about how the world is fucked and everything's fucked and it's just it's an absolute banger but um other than that i didn't really know anything about him so i did know of him and i knew he was an accomplished rapper an artist in his own right and not just some sort of random random guy they've got in but i had absolutely no idea about the rest of that stuff I mean, he he comes in at kind of round about the kind of minute and a half mark, um, and it kind of caught me by surprise, to be honest. Yeah. But I think it works really well. Some of the lyrics dropping like asses. I think he says. <laughs> I was a bit like, mm. but no, it it does work quite well, and you know they don't overuse it. And kind of the kind of one forty nine mark, the rest of the band come in all gels together quite well, in my opinion. Yeah, in fact, that's the only rapping on the album, so it's not like. Yeah. It's I, not like it becomes this sort of hard hip hop album or, no. or anything like that. It's just it's good. It's just brought in because it's it's good and it fits the song. Yeah, absolutely. Um, it doesn't really set a precedent for for what comes after, from a vocal standpoint, at least. Mm-hmm. What about? I mean, what what are the what are the real standouts for you? On I quite song? enjoyed Me TV. Yeah. As well, featuring Bobby Gillespie. Opens with lyrics, kind of turn down your me TV and turn up your community. And I thought it was going to be this kind of because the lyrics, some of the lyrics include, you know, I'll never be an individual, always be a human being, will never be an individual, 
will always be community and I thought it was going to be like this kind of nihilistic anthem you know I thought the kind of message we were going to portray that were just numbers but I think it's actually a call call for unity yeah um, it's more about getting off like you might be an individual but you're still part of the human race yeah. and kind of look after one another and what have you well, rather than just sort of looking out for yourself and I guess get off your screen yeah um, as well it's got a, it's got this big sort of stomp to it and like this big sing along chorus of turn down your me TV just huge drums proper swagger to it in the bass um, and then like you said it's featuring Bobby Gillespie who I didn't even know who he was but he's a front man for a primal screen yeah but I mean he's it's not just some random Scottish guy they've got in this but like you said I mean he's the front man of um, primal screen primal screen the name just went straight in my head there but I mean he's I suppose he's an all alternative artist in his own right. I think he was he was the drummer for Jesus and Mary Chain. Okay. I think that was his kind of first band. I mean, I I wasn't too sure about the inclusion of Bobby Gillespie. To be honest, like the kind of Scottish accent kind of caught me off guard. Us being Scottish, he kind of delivers this almost like this kind of sermon, kind of one part self help emotional kind of. Yeah self-helps kind of style another accident and injury claims <laughs> advice <laughs> and help you could almost just imagine him saying like have you had an accident at work that wasn't your fault <laughs> I, I think it's really good I think it's yeah. like I'm, he's I'm a weird just, bastard I think man. I'm just a sucker for like a Scottish monologue it's <laughs> like he's a Scottish dude talking about important trying to put forward a, an important message I guess, I guess maybe reminded me of sort of like the monologue at train spot in a way it's not you know in similarity to this sort of Scottish delivered monologue but I, I thought it was a good sort of it's quite it's a sort of focal point on that song it's yeah quite, quite entertaining and I mean I wouldn't have known who that guy was I just thought he was some Scottish bloke at first I just assumed he was a member of the band. I I think I listened. I was kind of listening to the listening to the song while I was up and about doing my own thing. I hadn't actually seen that it featured him, and I, I thought that set my mind thinking. What well, maybe a Scottish band for some reason? Well, that that was kind of what I thought, and then I went and checked, and you know, he's, it was featuring this guy. So I've also written down there. It reminded me of um, Muses' Knights of Sidonia, right? Okay, which is um, it's a bit different from a, your typical Muse song, but it's got that. It's got a, a very similar vibe. It's quite bombastic, mm. so you might gravitate towards this if if you like that kind of aspect of, of Muse as well. Mm-hmm. What other tracks stood out for you? <sighs> to be honest, Grant, all of them. Yeah. I think I think every song on this album is brilliant, and we skipped over Karma. You dig um, the third track. You come in through love. Um, <laughs> And then it completely changes when Aye. you come into Karma. You dig there's like so it's like Arcade Fire or MG MT style vocals at the start, but a bit harsher, a bit grimier. Uh-huh. And then there's like a really explosive bass sound, and the I mean the drums are so heavy throughout this album, but and the bass in fact, but it, it reminded me of Pendulum, their album in Silico in particular, where they took on a more rock kind of aspect of our sound where I think before they were really a sort of EDM band but they, they brought in these these huge buzzing bass sounds that just it just rattles your teeth if you're on if you're listening to it on a good set of headphones. Yeah. Or even a good stereo system. I don't have a good stereo system <laughs> but um yeah that 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 bass sound is so powerful. And then it's sort of juxtaposed by the these softer Lyrics. like I said like Arcade Fire or MGMT sort of style vocals on, on this song in particular but then I mean I could pick out pretty much anything yeah Body and Soul I've written the third song to feature another artist Christopher Hawkins <laughs> what? <laughs> just that computerised voice where he goes body <laughs> do you mean um, Stephen Hawkins? Stephen Hawkins what the fuck who's Christopher Hawkins? I don't know so yeah, it's got <laughs> it's got him in it. It's got Christopher Hawkins in it. So yeah, it's just got this body and soul. It's all we are. Refrain that's repeated, and I'm just gonna bring up Silver Tears Freak again because it's like body and soul. I'm a freak, yeah, and okay. It, okay, Silver Tears are, are more of a sort of punk punk anthem, but it just I can't I can't hear that lyric and not be reminded of Silver mm-hmm. Tears, and that's never a bad thing. But then it it just explodes in an absolute rager. Like again, I'm gonna bring up the prodigy, but it's like the prodigy. Like 
on fire. Like it's when the prodigy were at their hardest and sort of rockiest. This is this is what it kind of feels like, and it's like a escalating electronic sound yeah. that it just builds and builds and builds, and the instrumentation is powerful. You've got your robotic voice that you talked about, and um, then there's like really searing screamed vocals as well at times it's, it's just an immensely powerful yeah. song it reminded me of um, so that lyric I want your soul instantly reminded me of Apex's twins yeah, come to daddy Apex twins come to daddy that's a great great tune and yeah that's come to daddy's a lot more horrifying it's quite a frightening track but yeah I, get, I absolutely get the, it's got that sort of power behind it definitely I, th- I think we need to talk about youth man do you blame it on the youth man yeah so there's the there's an opening spoken word section shall I do it you go for it man so he goes (laughs) he goes I had you pegged as a liar right from the first time I saw your piggy little face (laughs) great impression and um, I think that just shows a bit of a sense of humour that there is on peppered throughout the album and again I keep I mentioned MGMT before but I struggle to think of other comparisons, but it's that sort of vocal styling yeah. um, it starts off with, and then it just explodes into a big clattering drum monster with sort of screeching vocals that sort of say youth man and um, settles back to a more calm sort of why do you go and blame it on the youth man sort of dreamy vocal, and it just goes back and forth between that, and it's a lot of fun, really good track. What, any other standouts in particular you want to talk about? Um, I really enjoyed Riches. Yeah, Riches and, is really good. And also Gutters. Yeah. I think Gutters, like, from the off, um, it kind of sounded a bit more like a traditional punk song, is what I've kind of written. Yeah. However, it kind of just under the kind of un- half minute mark, the kind of drum beat slightly changes, and it kind of belies the idea of it being an old song, kind of gives it a bit more of a kind of modern twist. Um, the bass and drums fade out for a kind of brief period, and then at the kind of minute mark, you've got the return of that kind of heavy industrial sound again that that we'd kind of heard in the previous tracks, and I think it just works together really well, to be honest. Yeah, I really enjoyed of, that one. Yeah, there's sort of stuttering electronics, and then we've got those those savage screams that are that are prominent on a lot of the tracks. I think it sort of opens with that sort of. Almost like a broken banjo kind of sound. It's an unusual noise. You couldn't quite pin it down. It's almost like oh, I don't know. It's maybe just an odd sample from somewhere. But that that's that's the only thing I could sort of liken it to. And and <clears throat> Rich, as you you mentioned before, has got just massive headbang guitar riffs, thumping drums. There's a bit of keyboards in there. <laughs> There's a weird interlude with the guy talking about the secret to, to eternal life. Yep. Um, with a bizarre sort of laugh, and then it completely changes and bursts into just a an absolute rager, which I likened a bit to like um, Six Shooter by Queens of the Stone Age. Right. Okay. Um, which is from their album Songs for the Deaf, and it's just kind of I don't know, a sort of raging punk song I guess it just kind of races towards the finishing yeah. line after that kind of unusual bridge like we said I was actually listening to this this album um, quite late at night I'd been to see the new It movie <laughs> and at one point I thought Pennywise had invaded my, my car stereo to be honest um, especially when I think because he, he lists you know the three secret secrets to eternal happiness one get rich two he kind of does this kind of chuckle, which for me reminded me of Pennywise. <laughs> get rich, and then three, you've got to get rich. Yeah. And then, like I said, you know, it just kind of bursts back in. And it's kind of just a race to the finish line after that. Yeah, it's a really good track. Um, but I mean, like I said before, they're all great. Second to last track, Trance. For me, this has got a really big Young Fathers vibe. Are you familiar with mm-hmm. Young Fathers? A wee bit. Yeah. Um, there's a song in particular from their album Coco Sugar from last year called In My View and it's very much of that ilk but it just it hits a lot harder in terms of the instrumentation it's I mean the whole album's like that it's got this real powerful backdrop um, but trance certainly sounds like they've been listening to some some young fathers and it's mm-hmm. a proper anthem with uh, throbbing electronics and it's just euphoric to listen to <laughs> Yeah, but in my notes I've kind of described it as probably the most 
positive sounding yeah. song on the album. Um, and then finally we close out with Power Drunk, which is kind of a fun <laughs> a fun uh, song <clears throat> to sing along to. There's um, this sort of opening refrain of Black Future, she better get used to it. And I kind of feel like, okay, they, they, they go on to sort of list some sort of shitty things about the world, but it feels almost like a statement of intent that Black Futures are here and uh, sort of here to stay kind yeah. of thing. So I think it's a really good way to end on that statement, really. Yeah, yeah. It'll be great to see what they come out in the future. So, what score would you give this overall? Um, nine out of ten. Yeah. Yeah. I'm reluctant to give anything a ten. Um, Aye. But you're you're quite I'm, you're tempted. I'm, I'm tempted to give this a ten, and the the only thing that's stopping me from doing it is that. In a few years' time, it might sound dated. You think? Like, because looking back at like Pendulums and Silico, at the time that came out, I absolutely loved it. And looking back on it now, it does sound a bit dated. Right. And while it, that might not happen to this album, it's just it's the only thing that makes me sort of hesitant to give it a ten. But fuck it, it's a ten. <laughs> it deserves to it's be a ten, ten out of ten. It's an absolutely phenomenal. And it's a debut as well, Grant. Ah, it's yeah. a debut album, and it's, it's, it's yeah, it's just blue shit. And this quality, really. it's just yeah, it's it's bonkers how good it is. A lot of texture, quite a lot of complexities, and I think it all works together really well. Uh, yeah, it's sort of experimental. You don't really know what's going where it's going to go next, and uh, yeah, perfect for perfect for a road trip as well. <laughs> Aye, just watch for speed cameras. Yeah, exactly. That's the only thing that will ruin your day. <laughs> What would you like to go on to discuss next then, my man? Do you want to talk about Black Mountain? Okay, yeah. Skip, skipping through your pages. Skipping through my pages, man. Long list of notes here. So Black Mountain's Destroyer. It's only an eight track album, so quite short. Um, it's actually only 42 minutes long. Uh, this was released on the 24th of May, 2019. Um, it is the sixth studio album from Black Mountain, who I would describe as prog rockers. I think that's fair to say. Yes, it is. Yeah, like psychedelic prog rock, I guess. Yeah, I've I kind of missed the last two albums. Um, however, kind of well acquainted with I think the, the first self titled album, in the future and um, Wilderness Heart, but I kind of missed the last two, so I haven't listened to them. In, in quite a while it's alright but overall quite underwhelming there's 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 points there's that's... bits and pieces on here that I really like um, and it's really I know we said it's sort of prog psychedelica mm-hmm. but there's a lot of classic rock on, on there as well absolutely um, sort yeah. of big rock and roll riffs classic rock solos you've got that sort of dual guitars that Iron Maiden do and Judas Priest mm-hmm I think there's a bit of Sabbath on here as well. There's even maybe a bit of the Doors and the Rolling Stones at points. Well, it's interesting you see the Rolling Stones because track five, Pretty Little Lazies. The kind of opening bars reminded me of Painted Black. I found that for... Uh, yeah, no, I said that. I was about to say I found that for a different track, but no, <laughs> it, is, it is Pretty Little Lazies. Yeah. Um, yeah, absolutely. And um, there was a bit of T-Rex in there as well? Most probably, yeah. Yeah, I'm trying to remember which track it is off the top of my head. But there's a lot, there's a lot of that stuff, these sort of things peppered throughout these tracks. The first track, Future Shade, gives you a sort of idea that classic rock kind of influences. That sounds sort of Iron Maiden, Judas Priest. I wasn't a huge fan of the vocals on on the opening track. They felt a bit amateurish at times. Right. Okay. Um, not. I found it difficult to pick out some of the the lyrics, um, and there wasn't a lot to sort of hook on to and sing along with them I'll give you on that. a lot yeah. of the songs to be fair and there's a bit of synths thrown in um, a sort of dueling guitar solo at the end of that track and the following song Horns Arising is a sort of more it's more sort of grinding stoner rock and then they've got some weird auto-tuning vocals mm-hmm. 
there's a bit of sci-fi sort of synth thrown in there as well but I mean there's some 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 good head head buying riffs and, and decent sort of crooning um, solos but it kind of completely changes about the halfway point into almost a sort of acoustic fairy tale it reminded me of sort of stairway to heaven at, at times with a sort that, of kind yeah. of panpipe kind of sound well I, I would say it's quite similar to tyrants from their 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 second album is quite similar yeah. and they've got the kind of pan pipes and tyrants mm. as well so it's obviously something they quite like using they take that classic rock sound and add a ton of fuzz and distortion to it rather than the sort of the, the cleaner sound of like Led Zeppelin or, or like Iron Maiden there's a mm. lot more fuzz and sort of grime on it yeah they remind me a bit of a, a band called um, the one and only People Mover have you heard no heard of this? I've heard, I think I've heard is that the guys that dress up like yetis? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, so they're basically, I think there's two of them that dress up as yetis, and then the other one is like supposed to be like their their zookeeper. Okay. And they've escaped, and he's trying to catch them. Right. But instead of catching them, they just, just all play just, rock and roll music and together. Roll each other. And it's got the same sort of big stomping um, drums and fuzzy riffs, and there's a bit of voice manipulation and stuff on there. People Mover just released an album this year as well. It's not that good, but if you go back to their like first EP, that's that's quite good. Um, this the opening track, People Mover, on that is really good. Right. So they're worth checking out as an aside. Then you've got Closer to the Edge. Just a total throwaway song, really. It um, is, but it's like um, like you're travelling through space or down a wormhole or something. Yeah. And it's not. It's just an interlude. It's not a proper song. Yeah. It, it never really amounts to anything. Um, it was over before I'd realised it begun, to be honest. It's three, three minutes long, just under three minutes, kind of 253. However, it does get a wee bit of a reprise later on in the album. It's on track seven, so second seven. to last track, Licence to Drive. Yeah. Which um, very much to me sounds like a, a, a sort of Black Sabbath kind of tribute almost. Some of the vocals even sound a little bit like Ozzy Osbourne, and it's. It's got a bit of a thrash aesthetic as, as well, mm-hmm. so it's it's not a bad song. And then you've got a, a kind of cool callback to to the electronics of Closer to the Edge, mm-hmm. so it's a nice touch whether you're into Closer to the Edge or not. High Rise is the track where I feel like there's a sort of Doors vibe, maybe just with a bit more of a grunt to it. There's more of a sort of vocal moment in this sort of repeated high rise lyrics that you can you can catch on to a little bit and join in with but it does feel like just that drug induced trip <laughs> this sort of thing where you look at your you look at your hands and the ends of your fingers ping off, into, <laughs> ping off into the distance or something like that and it reminded me for whatever reason of um, a scene in the film Zoolander where they um, they all take peyote or something right. and end up in a massive orgy and there's like um they're all going around an orgy and there's sort of this fat Chinese guy that joins in that all I can get is the image of the fat, <laughs> fat Chinese, Chinese guy like laughing um, uh, so is that know. somehow in keeping with like the Doors the Doors reference because obviously they're kind of quite a trippy band or were quite a trippy yeah. band back in the day um, Doors of Perception which is where they get their name from oh okay Aldous Huxley book is it I think that's how you pronounce his name Aldous Huxley yeah yeah that's where the name comes from uh, to be fair, the high rise is probably my my favourite song. Yeah. yeah, I think you're right. I think it's maybe the only song where you can kind of hook on to the lyrics. Loneliest cock in the sky, <laughs> <laughs> Be, being one of them, said with absolutely no irony or kind of you know they weren't trying to be tongue in cheek or anything like that. I don't think. Yeah, I th- it's difficult. There there may be other points where the lyrics of you know, sort of lyrics that you could pick out, but. I find it really hard to like to, yeah. to, to latch on to the vocals are kind of they're kind of lost a little bit um, in amongst all the reverb exactly, and the buzz all that. and the guitars yeah. and synth yeah there, I mean there's quite a bit of instrumentation to, to enjoy yeah like you mentioned before Pretty Little Lazies is a bit like uh, Rolling Stones Painted Black there's Boogie Lover which is basically just a 70s porno um, theme song. <laughs> well, I, I've written in my notes, opens with a fat bass line. Fat is being spelt P-H. Yeah, yeah um, it's a pretty Quite good. enjoyed that. Um, but it is kind of a song you feel, if you're listening to that with the windows down in your car, you might feel slightly embarrassed to listen to it. <laughs> it sounds like you're watching a 70s porno. Um, it's like, 
the sort of weird guitar and organ flourishes you might expect to hear Aye. that kind of thing as well so it's a bit odd um, but <clears throat> ultimately the, the, the closing track FD72 mm-hmm. is um, is my favourite track I think and it very much I'm not a fan of David Bowie Bowie? 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 David Bowie Bowie David Bowie David Bowie. not a fan of David Bowie <laughs> but the vocals are quite Bowie-esque oh absolutely it's um, definitely a homage to David Bowie and he even references The Man Who Fell, Fell to Earth yeah, which exactly. is a David Bowie film um, it builds in a similar way to um, Radiohead's song Freak I don't know if you felt that it's got that kind of build that um, ultimately Radiohead's Freak kind of explodes into sort of rage over the end but it's got that sort of slow build up uh-huh. to that point it's dark it's foreboding yeah it's uncomfortable there's a bit of a sort of lost boys vibe thinking like cry little sister sort of thing and sort of shades of echo in the bunnyman's the killing moon as well mm. um it's got there's that sort of gothic vibe yeah and then whilst it doesn't build to quite the climax that radio and freak might it does have some sort of screeching guitar lines at the end which are really quite good so it's a good it's a good ending to the album definitely the standout track for me yeah I, I would agree with I mean I'd like I said high rise high rise in this one's probably the, the two standout tracks for me yeah um, but yeah on the whole out of the albums that we've reviewed so far it's the one that I've went back to um, the least amount of times yeah, I mean, I've I've gone back to it a few times for the purpose of doing this, but I don't know if I really would otherwise. It's not bad. It's not bad. I mean, I suppose if, you, if you're a fan of Black Mountain, I would say in particular the, the first two albums, because Wilderness Heart, their third album, which I think was released around about 2010, it's the one with the big great white in it. It looks as if it's coming through a window or something. It's quite strange. Okay. Um, it did feel different from the first two. I can't comment on the fourth and fifth album because I haven't listened to them, but I feel as if this is maybe a return to the stuff that they've done previously, but maybe not as good. Interestingly, I think it's only there's only two of the original members left. Really? I think there's been quite a few changes over the last few years. Stephen McBean, I think that's how you pronounce McBean. I don't know how you pronounce his surname, but the lead vocalist and I think the the original keyboardist are the only two surviving members. Hmm. Okay, I mean I, I don't really have any context for the let rest of Black Mountain stuff because I, I haven't gone back and listened to any of that stuff. It's just this album, and I mean it's not bad. I I don't hate it. If you like this kind of thing, you know, psychedelic rock, a bit of classic rock, some heavy metal, that kind of stuff, then you might you might be into it. Yeah. Um, and if uh, most of the songs are quite long, other than maybe. It's sort of in, they're, all interlude about, they're all about five minutes, I think. Yeah, four or five minutes. Which is quite long, and okay, they do mix it up within the songs a bit, but sometimes it can get a little repetitive. But if that's your jam, then you you might you might be well into this. Yeah, and I suppose a lot of kind of prog rocks like that anyway, isn't it? Really, True. when you think about it. So yeah, if you're a fan of that type of thing, it's worth a listen. Well, would so, you rate it if you were to rate it? A seven? Mm. Is that generous? I think that's too generous. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> I, I, I'm not to give it a five out of ten. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'd say probably six, yeah. to be honest. Six out of ten. I, I, I guess I gave it a seven because I didn't really want to shit all over it. Because I don't, <laughs> cause I don't think it's a bad album. I just, it's not, I don't know if it's... It's your thing. Maybe not your thing. My thing, yeah. particularly. It's but there, there is, there is, there's some stuff on there that I enjoy, so maybe a six is more accurate. Cool. Black album. I'm go for a Weezer, right? <laughs> Something I forgot to mention entirely <laughs> was that every album on, on this list is uh, is black related. If you haven't noticed already, <laughs> we've got black features, we've got Weezer's black album, uh-huh. we've got Black Mountain, 
Black Francis. Black Francis for um for the Pixies. For the Pixies. And there's another black related album to come after this. But let's go for Weezer's black album. Okay, so this is the thirteenth studio album by mm-hmm. Weezer. Mm-hmm. Like It's quite phenomenal, isn't I can't it? Actually, believe to it. have that that body of work. How would you describe this album? I actually really liked it. I, I, I really liked it. Yeah. I like Weezer, um, but I can't say I'm a, a huge fan, uh, if that's, that makes that's... sense. I've kind of dipped into them um, over the years. But I think I think it's a, it's a major departure from anything that they've done previously. Um, and they know that, they acknowledge that within within the album itself, within the kind of lyrical content, certainly within the first couple of couple of songs. So I think if you are a massive fan of Weezer, you're probably not going to like this very much. If if you, yeah, I'm coming at it from the same point of view as you. I'm a fan of Weezer, but I'm not a diehard fan of no. Weezer, and I've kind of dipped in and out of them over the years. Yeah. Um. But yeah, if you're a diehard fan of early Weezer, like you're gonna hate this <laughs> like I mean unless you're open minded if you're if you're if you're like I, I want nothing but the blue album and the green album then you're not gonna like this not not with Weezer's name on it anyway it's interesting I, I read a review in the Black Album yeah by a guy called check this out Corey Van Der H- Hogenband <laughs> okay <laughs> for a website called Exclaim that was published on the 27th of February 2019. He was quite critical of the album as a whole, however described it as an utterly skippable collection that would be entirely unremarkable if not for the fact it was released by Weezer. And he rated it a 3 out of 10. Now, I kind of agree with that, to be honest. I heard Living in LA, which is kind of one of the singles, can't quite remember when that was released, but I remember hearing that a wee while back, and I think I thought it was a Maroon 5 song. <laughs> that's so, fair enough, yeah, that's fair enough. But I think it's just quite fun to think of Weezer doing songs like this. I think I think that's the best way to describe it, it's just a fun album. Well, I found it a fun yeah, album. Yeah, it's, it's just... It's a fun album full of pop songs. It's yeah, just that's fun, exactly. fun, radio-friendly pop songs and I think what that guy's latched onto there that if they're a bit throwaway maybe they are but as a collection of songs it's quite it's quite fun to yeah, listen to I, I, I enjoyed it I mean my eldest daughter loves the album to be honest we've been listening to it quite a lot you know, like in in the car and you know whenever we kind of kind of stop the car I can hear her singing away, singing away to the, in the back yeah um, yeah I mean I suppose that the point is not to take it too seriously, to be honest. Yeah, throw throw away any sort of Pre- preconceptions of what you think a Weezer album should sound like, because this is not. Other than Rivers Cuomo's sort of undeniable voice, uh-huh. recognizable voice, there's not really anything that sounds like Weezer. Saying that, I, I I wouldn't even say that his voice. I mean, I I didn't. I don't recognise these songs mm. as being Weezer songs. Like I said, I mean, living in LA, I thought that was a, a Maroon Five song the yeah. first time I heard it. I think High's a Kite. Maybe you can kind of recognise his voice in that song. That was one of the, the the singles from the album as well. Yeah, I think High is a Kite is just the most Weezer it gets. Yeah, um, and even then, it's 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 more like a nursery rhyme, <laughs> um, a sort of floaty, dreamlike nursery rhyme. And it's got this. It's got a huge sing along chorus about you know I'm high as a kite. Um, so, and pretty much every song on here has got parts that you can just easily sing along to. First time you hear it, you're singing along with the chorus straight away because mm-hmm. it's quite. They're all quite simple and straightforward. I think there were three singles, and four singles. Four actually. singles. So there's can't yeah. can't not hustle, zombie bastards, high as a kite, and living in L.A. Yeah. Can't not hustle. Well, California Snow was a was that a single? That was, was that a later? single as well, I think. Was it? Um, so what's that? It's half the tracks um, of the album were singles. First time I heard Can't Not the Hustle, I didn't. I kind of hated it. Um, oh, right. I was just like, what is this? And it was kind of that knee jerk reaction. This isn't Weezer. Um, this is you know I don't like it. But 
you, the more you hear it, you can't really deny. You can't help but sing along to man. Like, yeah, like you, you can't not the hustle, man. You can't um, not the hustle. And it's got this sort of Latino vibe to it. Yeah. I've said sort of El Cucaracha esque. Yeah. I don't know if it's kind of mariachi El Cucaracha, horns about, about, in the background. Yeah. So it's a fun song. Zombie Bastards. Again, first time I heard it, I hated it. Right. But then I kind of latched on to that. Um, that die die you zombie bastards vocal melody which is just again it's really fun to, to sing along to in my opinion but I think both these tracks can't, ho- can't knock the hustle and zombie bastards they're outright saying like Weezer's a band are outright saying we know what you want we know why you're here you're not getting it <laughs> <laughs> I mean the, the chorus to, to zombie bastards is die die you zombie bastards we know what you want die die you zombie bastards yeah. Um, later, I think er, earlier on, say everybody's playing it safe, playing la di da, you know. So you know they they know what people have come to expect of them, and they're just having a bit of fun, you know what I mean? They're not they're not playing to the crowd anymore. Yeah, and and Rivers Cuomo has come to be known as a bit of an internet prankster, a uh, sort of meme aficionado, and like what we were talking about. Um, on the the first episode about the whole the teal album. the teal album and all the story about how that came about and how they were asked to to um, cover um, Toto's Africa mm-hmm. and instead of covering that they covered different Toto song just to troll everyone and that that's his kind of personality so yeah you f- you almost feel it, like you say that this whole album is like trolling <laughs> Weezer's fan base but it's just like. Who does that to their own audience? <laughs> but it's kind of genius. What I mean, what can you say about it? Living in a way, it's a Katy Perry song, maybe. Katy Perry or Taylor Swift or something like that. Really catchy chorus. Like this, <laughs> the lyrics are like this girl I like talking about this girl I like, but I feel so lonely, and it's just like that's a bit my that. eldest daughter repeats. Yeah, I know, <laughs> she likes that. So it's it's so catchy that. A three-year-old. A three-year-old can, can sing the chorus. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and it reminded me of the bad lip reading Bushes of Love yes. song as well. I don't know why, but it did. I mean, even on Living LA, there's there's a, a pretty cool bass line and some, some jacket guitars. They're sort mm. of buried in the mix a little bit, but they're there. A <laughs> piece of cake it opens with the line, let's do hard drugs, fix our problems. It's sung in such like a, forgive the pun, a sort of sugar-coated way. Yeah, it's it's quite rel- ridiculous, and it's got a sort of do 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 sort of like that la di da sort ah, of bit from yeah. some zombie bastards, bastards and some piano and some hand claps, but there's some sort of razor edged guitar licks in there again, sort of buried away, and um, sort of harking back to what maybe you could have had. <laughs> I don't know if that's deliberate or it's just a layer to the song, but it could be a little sort of instrumentation of what Weezer once were thrown in here and there into the mix yeah um, are, there, are there any other particular songs you um, latched onto in the, the Black Album um, <laughs> I've just written some lyrics down that I found quite funny yeah. um, so I'm just being honest you slipped me your CD asked if I'd listen me and my critique I listened to it but halfway through I had to quit your band sounds like shit. Yeah, so, yeah it's, a, it's really good. And again, just sound quite poppy with that the kind of chorus. I can't quite remember how it goes. Here we go. Oh, here we go. Don't be mad about. I'm just yeah. I'm, I'm just being just honest. Being honest. And yeah. it, that's the thing. Like, there's just hooks everywhere on this yeah. album. Just vocal just hooks like everywhere. Every song, there's something to watch onto. California snow. Yeah. Um, I think that's maybe my favorite track on the album. It's got a sort of buzzing guitar electronic intro and he's, he, there's sort of jokey things he throws and he Rivers is just sort of talking and he says this is the definition of flow so he's <laughs> some kind of gangster rapper or something but he's just talking he's not even yeah. attempting to rap and then you've got this um, the sort of catchy chorus California snow never let me go because I'm down because I'm down if you're down and I mean and then you've got a sort of buzzing riff and a stomping drum beat over the top of that I mean is he talking about doing cocaine? Is that what California, California Snow, Snow is? I never thought of that. I, I don't know, but um, I like to think that that's what he's talking about. Because yeah. he's, he's like, I'm down if you're down. Um, possibly. 
I like to think that he's written a pop song about doing cocaine. <laughs> That'd be quite good. Why not? Too many thoughts in my head is a sort of it's kind of an open and honest sort of take on <laughs> it's sort of on like anxiety a little bit, like in and Is that not the one that starts with <laughs> <laughs> stayed up late reading Mary Poppins yeah I'm not saying it's not ridiculous <laughs> but I'm saying that there are moments in a where he's sort of being honest about his own like stay, you know, he's staying up late and he's worrying about things but yeah it does say he's staying up late and watching Netflix and having uh, and one of the lines is I'm so high on cookies that's insane. exactly what I've written down man I'm so high on cookies it's insane it's kind of an overall kind of disco theme to disco kind of feel yeah. to this song so I think it's a it's a sort of stupid song, but I think there is some sort of commentary on Rivers' struggles with anxiety and self doubt. But maybe I'm just trying, to, <laughs> trying, trying to find find some meaning. Yeah, yeah, trying to find some meaning in the madness. Um, the Prince who wanted everything is uh, it's like a party time <laughs> children's song. <laughs> um, with lots of do do do's. doos. Um, I I'm I'm not a big fan of uh, the Prince who wanted everything to be honest but I'll, start, I'll sing along to it to be honest when it comes <laughs> on I can't it's hard can't help not it. to um, and then Byzantine I mean possibly the weirdest song on here I've described it as Muzak is it kind of yeah. like elevator music type feel to it I've written I have no idea how to describe this song <laughs> at all but then I've gone and say as a shuffling sort of sheep sheep aesthetic but then uh, I've wrote Americana kind of prom band mm, type yeah. sound to it um. <laughs> put this line in it is, put on your red beret baby and moonwalk naked across the room hmm. so, <laughs> is this some of the in- images that the, this um, album conjure up aye uh, uh, this is total throwaway bit of information but I read an interview it was a billboard interview by a guy I think it's a guy Maybe a woman, Gab Ginsburg. Uh, it was released okay. on the first of March two thousand nineteen. That the bridge from Byzantine is that how we're yeah. pronouncing it is originally from a pre Weezer band that Rivers Como and the drummer Patrick Wilson were in called okay. Fuzz. In that same interview, they kind of talk quite a lot about how Rivers Como has came to compile set lists and and songs. I think he's recently graduated from I don't know what the name of the university is however it's it's to do with I think it's kind of like musical engineering or something apparently he's he uses a lot of algorithms to come up with music that will be popular or that will succeed that will do well and I kind of wondered whether maybe that had a part to play in the conception of this you, album I think you can hear there's certainly something that makes this really easy to listen to. Yeah. And overall, I really quite enjoy it. So there, there is sort it. of a... And I wouldn't... You could believe that he's sitting... I mean, I've heard rumours that he sits and writes music by spreadsheet. And he's been doing that for a long time. Um, so you can you can absolutely imagine that these songs have been... I don't want to say cynically, but, you know, engineered That's to sound a certain sound, yeah. way and to be scientifically popular does that make sense yeah um, but then does do, do these songs even get played on the radio I, don't I certainly think Living in LA either. has been played on the radio because like I said um, I have heard it I had heard it before hmm. um, I don't really listen to the radio so no. I've got no kind of uh, I can't really comment on that I don't know about the rest of them Not but sure. um, like we've been saying before if 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 you if you go into this album thinking it's going to be the new, it's going to be the like sequel to the blue album you've been waiting for, since since the nineties or whatever, you're you're not gonna you're not gonna like what you hear. But if you can kind of just take it on face value as like a a sort of fun pop album, that's perfect for being out in, in you know the sunshine, um, then it's it's a pretty good album. Yeah, to be quite honest. Well, like I said, I enjoyed it. Um, however, I, I would kind of chime in with what that guy, Corey Vander Hogan Band, said. If somebody had given me this album and said, that's the new album by, I don't know, 
can't help but like Taylor Swift or fucking Justin Bieber or something like that you just in- instantly dismiss it um, I think it's just fun to think that Weezer are trying out something yeah Weezer know. Weezer can release something like this like yeah. they've got they've got to that level where they can just be like we're, we're just going to release whatever the fuck we want yeah. um, <laughs> and see what happens how'd you rate it? I'm a bit torn because I suppose we've just got to rate it on enjoyment. Yeah. I can't really rate it on anything else. So I, I kind of have to give this a 9 out of 10. <laughs> right. Because yeah. I really like it. And it, I think I think in a few years' time, I'm going to be like, oh, I'm not really going to find myself going back to it. But I can't, I can't criticise it too much because it does, it kind of does what it seeks to do. Yeah. And it does it really well. I would, I would agree. Like I said, it's, it's one of the albums that we've covered uh, this week where you know, I've, I've just went back to it repeatedly. So yeah, I would kind of agree with you, kind of about 8, 9 out of 10. Yeah, I certainly can't. I couldn't justify saying... 10 out of 10. This is... No, I mean, I can't even justify going to the opposite end of this yeah. and saying this is a 3 out of 10 and it's garbage. Because it absolutely it's not. is not. Um, it, regardless of whether you think it's disposable and doesn't sound like Weezer. It's mm-hmm. it's it's still it's still a good album. Yeah. Okay, the last album we're gonna talk about is a new album by Black Dresses. It's called Thank You. Um there are two piece electronic noise pop band from Toronto, Canada. I was introduced to them through their debut record Waste Isolation, which came out last year. Um, it's actually on my list of favourite albums of 2018. So, um, definitely worth going back to. Waste Isolation is in all caps and every song on the album is in all caps. I think it's very deliberate because it's a very abrasive album and I think it's deliberately to be like all caps as in shouting right. sort of thing um, so I really liked Waste Isolation so they're quite a prolific band obviously they've come out with Thank You I think in February yeah I've got 5th of um, February so I kind of threw this in here to see what Grant would think about this album <laughs> and this band um, so I've just listened to it once I listened to it earlier on today um, the notes I've got here, I don't really have all that much notes, however, I've written on initial listen, it almost sounded like the bastard daughter of the Mouldy Peaches, um, which is the, the guys that came up with the, the Juno soundtrack. Also described it as, it's almost like something from Clueless, the film, the 90s film Clueless, almost kind of came across as being these kind of two vacuous kind of gossipy girls with kind of noise pop <laughs> over the top of it, layered on top of it. However, I think if you actually kind of spend some time to look at the, the kind of lyrics, the, the, there's kind of no one intelligent to it and it kind of belies that idea, that, you know, like I said, them being vacuous and gossipy and what have you. Um, and I use the example of Death slash Bad Girl, where the two artists kind of dis- are discussing this, this other girl. They kind of describe her as being death obsessed. That girl's fucked in the head. She's so messed up. She's so much. But then they later go on to say, I want to be her friend, I want to be her pal, um, and dead bitches recognise, dead bitches recognise each other. Yeah, I, I, I think there's a really great line <laughs> about the dead bitches recognise, and it's delivered in such a sort of creepy, yeah. creepy way. Um, for context, as you probably know, that this sort of clueless gospel girl <laughs> aesthetic is delivered over the top of heavy industrial electronics. Yeah. <laughs> And I found in that time, the, the vocals where they're talking about this girl are almost like they're casting a spell in the delivery. I felt like it was sort of kind of like an antidote to like Billie Eilish's bad guy in the sort of, I'm a bad girl, bad girl kind of, there's a sort of similarity there. Mm. And towards the end of that song, it just ends in a sort of writhing electronic cacophony. And generally, there's not a lot of singing on here. It's, it's not even rap, it's sort of spoken word. The closest they get to singing is they some of the vocals are kind of modulated a little bit at times 
um, to be a bit more melodic. Um, but yeah, it's, there's a lot of really heavy industrial noises on here. The, the opening song, Thank You, is just like an, in, uh, an industrial machine. Um, mm -hmm. And then it's got another one of these sort of creepy folk art refrains, the sick only have each other. Yeah. Um, which if anyone's familiar with the band Daughters, they came out with an album last year called You Won't Get What You Want, which is a really dark, creepy, industrial album. It's quite difficult to listen to, but it's it's really rewarding um, if you can actually give it the time. It reminds me of that album if Daughters were a sort of electro-pop duo, I suppose. Uh -huh. um, but it's that sort of darkness. And that sort of leads... From Thank You, you lead into the next song, Dog Shit, which is sort of bouncy electronics, um, talking about how everything in their lives is dog shit. But it's got quite a poppy chorus. And there are quite sort of poppy moments on here, in amongst the sort of electronic chaos. Mm -hmm. I don't know why I latched onto this so much. I think it's just because it's experimental and it's heavy but it's also melodic and it does all of those things at once and um, it kind of draws me in yeah I mean if you look at there's there's a few standout songs for me you talked about Death Bad Girl yeah um, there's there's Wheel of Fortune which um, has really deranged vocals screaming howling nightmarish electronica sounds but then there's like a really poppy auto-tune chorus which is about it, which says, I dream of blue skies, I dream of green grass, I dream of one world, I dream of oceans vast. But all the while, the vocals are cracking up and crumbling. And it's, it's, at times it's this, the vocals are terrifying. Mm -hmm. But I really, I really like that, that sort of crumbling pop aesthetic. It's difficult to listen to, but I think if you let it take hold, you get a lot out of it. And mo most of the tracks are like that. I mean, water, um, sort of buzzing, grinding electronics, um, and it's about the people who control the money and pollute the water in the world. And um, it's quite dark. And then there's a, a poppy middle section that goes on about one day in the future. I pray everything will be all right. I pray everyone poisoning water and hoarding resources will die. Yeah. So, and it's it's these sort of cutting lyrics that are like you say, sort of, they take away from that sort of vacuous, clueless kind of vibe that you, you get from um, sometimes from the, the vocal delivery. Yeah, it's, it's the delivery that where I got that. Yeah. So, as this goes on, it becomes, for me at least, as it goes on, it becomes maybe a bit more cohesive, but it also gets heavier, especially with the vocals. There's nothing here worth dying for and it's got a really cool drum beat, the scarred guitar riff, so they, they, they start bringing in guitars. And then there's like a shrieking electronic sound that they know this is hard to listen to. They're deliberately pushing the boundaries. Um, there's just a sort of shrieking electronic sound. They, they hold it for just a little bit too long. So it, can, it becomes quite uncomfortable, especially if you're listening to it in headphones. And then you start getting sort of black metal um, inspired screaming so sort of like witchy sort of harpy screams and there's even sort of the electronics start going at a pace almost like a blast beat which is a sort of type of drumming associated with black metal so i like i like how heavy it gets maybe the most accessible song is through the void it sounds a bit sounds a bit like a video game like streets of rage soundtrack kind of it's got hand claps it's got guitar riffs and then it's got like um, a chorus. It's almost like the um, guitar, like from Mission Impossible, mm -hmm. and with with a sort of stomping beat. And it's it's just a fucking tune, basically. It's a really really good tune. With, without going through every song, there's just a lot of variety. There's sort of muted vocals. There's heavy vocals. There's screaming. There's um, heavy electronics. There's interesting little interludes. There's guitars, grunting bass lines, and after all that, it, it, you know, again, like I said, it sort of builds to a heavy conclusion. But the last song, um, Baby Steps, is basically a sort of cynical nursery rhyme um, about taking your first steps and, and growing, growing up and then looking forward to a bright future that's something that's not necessarily 
gonna happen. Gonna happen. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I, I really like this album. I'm not sure many people will. I think it'd be quite hard. I, I, I think folk would find it quite. What's the word I'm looking for? <laughs> hard to, hard to access. Yeah, there's, there's, there is a barrier to entry. I'll, I'll accept that. I think. But I, th- I think you're right. I mean, like I said, I've only kind of listened to it once, but th- there were tracks in there. Like I said, I don't really have all that much notes here in front of me, but I think when I heard the opening track, Thank You, I was very tempted just to turn it off and be like, oh, yeah. forget this, man. <laughs> um, but I did persevere with it, and there were points that I, I, enjoy, I quite enjoyed Dog Shit, the second. Yeah. Um, so that's the one that where I, I kind of thought, well, that sounds to be a bit like Mouldy Peaches. But yeah, there certainly were points that I, that I quite enjoyed. Um, so I think I will go back to revisit it. Certainly, like I said, I did enjoy that Death Bad Girl song. Mm-hmm. But yeah, you're right, you can see how people might find it off putting. You mentioned the kind of screaming lyrics. I mean, it sounds like they're getting murdered at one, <laughs> at one point. I was trying to find the song, and it's basically. Where is it? I thought it was Wheel of Fortune for some I thought it was. I thought it was Wheel of Fortune as well, but I'm sure I had written something down about it. But basically, it was like the vocals started fairly normal. And as the song progresses, they get more deranged and sort of more, they crack up more. And eventually it's like someone being tortured. Uh, yeah, but it's absolutely. Like, it, it reminded me of like a sort of damned creature. It's like Gollum from Lord of the Rings, like being tortured, like screaming, like to that kind of complete change from this female vocal to just this horrible tortured soul. Be interesting to see them as a live act. Yeah, I don't know how they perform this, whether it's, I presume it's like a backing track beats yeah. and they perform the vocals, but how they get that, how, how that scream is performed live would be would be interesting to experience yeah, live. To produce. I just I imagine it being a bit of an assault on the senses, like the whole thing just being an assault on the senses, to be honest. Yeah. I'd be quite interested to see that. So, Black Futures is an album that I felt was it was a good experience on like a car stereo like driving down the highway whereas this I feel like is more a headphone experience this yeah right. dark dresses I think if you listen to it on head, in headphones you're kind of drawn into the world a bit more and for something like this it's got all these different layers and sort of strange things going on you need to spend time with it I think I mean like i uh, like you said, a lot of people just listen to the first couple of seconds of the opening track and be like, nope, no. this is not for me. And that's fine. A lot of people it's not going to be for, um, and they're never going to get into it, regardless of how many times they attempt to listen to it. But I suppose good things come to those who wait, doesn't it? I mean, thank you. The opening track, kind of similarities with Death from Above. You're a woman, I'm a machine, the first song. That's just noise, really, yeah. for the most part. Um, but if you persevere through it, there are kind of there are some hidden gems in amongst there. Yeah, it's like any album. The more you listen to it, the more you notice little over. bits and pieces that you didn't notice before. And generally, if it's a good album, your your enjoyment increases. Has any of these been released as singles? I've never had time to. Go. <sighs> I have no idea. I'm not sure whether these would work as singles. Ah, that's what I was thinking. I mean, like... the closest would maybe be through the void because it's like. It's got that sort of driving, like Mission Impossible esque part to it, which which is really catchy. So that, that's probably the one that stands out as the most accessible song, mm-hmm. and maybe a single. But I don't know honestly if they have released singles from this. They maybe have on like Spotify, like released a yeah a single or whatever. But yeah, so I'm glad that you did the listen, time to to listen to it. I'm to glad it. that you took the time to listen to it because I was worried that your reaction would be I'm not, this is shit, immediately just like, this is terrible <laughs> um, I mean I even wrote in my notes on the first track the word I've described it as dreadful industrial machinery and I mean I don't mean dreadful as in awful um, I mean dreadful as in full of dread oh, oh, yeah ominous but other people would just say it's just dreadful. It's just noise. It just sounds dreadful. Yeah. It's just it literally is just noise. <laughs> but I think if you give it a chance and you're more open to sort of more experimental music, it helps if you're into electronic music for a start. 
and probably some some of the heavier sides of extreme metal as well because there is that crossover later on in the album where he's talking about the sort of uh-huh. black metal aspects so it definitely helps if you've got some kind of uh, <laughs> love for, for those genres as well so overall sort of thoughts on I, I don't feel places. as if I can comment I certainly don't feel as if I can rate it you're going to have to give a rating um, the first time I heard it I probably would have given it a 7 right but I I think it's better than that I think it's a solid 8 Right. If you if you like this kind of thing, and if you like if you like that daughter's album, you won't get what you want. You you probably get something out of this, but that is <laughs> that is a very difficult album to get into as well. It took mm-hmm. me a few times to to even be able to listen to the first track on the album. Right. Okay. So it's uh, for people willing to put in some time. <laughs> put in the effort. Some some people don't want to do that with music they just want to be like turn it on and be like this is good why should I have to work it enjoying an album this is quite an interesting juxtaposition with the black the black album Weezer's black album because that's instantly this is, this is, this complete, is instantly accessible whereas this is the this complete is, opposite this is absolutely the complete opposite yeah um, yeah interesting that we're talking about these two albums aye so, that wasn't deliberate but it's worked quite well yeah it's worked quite well <laughs> talking about these back to back um, so if you want some immediate pop anthems Listen to Weezer's Black Album. If you want to <laughs> listen to some... You want to put some graft in. If you want to put some graft in, yeah, and listen to some uh, dreadful <laughs> industrial beats with um, vacuous... Clueless. Clueless and uh, black metal harpy screams <laughs> uh, over the top, then um, give Black Dresses a go. Uh, you might enjoy it. Cool. Okay, are we done? I think so. We're done. Well, that's a wrap. Big thanks to Grant once again and to those who stuck around after episode one. For any newbies out there, please go back and check out that episode and subscribe so you don't miss any future episodes. We're available on Spotify, Apple Music, SoundCloud, YouTube and direct from the website. Don't forget that the Scratchcast is the official podcast of the Head Scratcher where we share all things alternative pop culture. Head over to theheadscratcher.com, check out our Facebook page or follow us on Twitter at ScratcherHead. Finally, at the end of every month we release a massive playlist of new music so make sure you check those out too the September playlist just dropped and it's full of absolute bangers I'm Sneds, this was the Scratchcast, thanks again for listening catch you next time It's not finished It's finished